Warning. This video contains lots of stick figure violence, including goofy cartoonish blood. Some sections also include some screen shake or flickering effects. I love one finger death punch. I mean, I love it. Love it. I spent dozens of hours in the original game. And I'm, uh, I'm pretty good at it. Pretty good. I've completed the entire game on all difficulty levels. Just looking at my Steam achievements, I've gotten at least 3,500 kills in survival mode, 2,500 in blind survival mode, and 2,000 in no Luca no mode. I'm hardly the best in the world, but definitely in the top percent or two of players. Some of you might be surprised by that. I'm not exactly a fan of violent games in general, but One Finger Death Punch is special. It's not about violence, it's about reflexes. It's about getting into a flow, almost like a meditative state. When I'm playing, I don't even notice what's going on on most of the screen. I'm hyper-focused on that hit bar in the center. It's somehow both energizing and relaxing at the same time. When I finally get taken down in survival mode, I lean back, take a deep breath, and I'm often surprised to realize just how much time has passed. When I record a play session and then watch it afterwards, I can't believe I was really moving that fast. It's all about getting in the zone. Yeah, I love One Finger Death Punch. I do not love One Finger Death Punch 2. Uh, but I wanted to love it so very much. When I heard they were making a sequel, I got so excited. I was eager to see how they could possibly improve on a formula that seemed so perfect already. Unfortunately, it seems they, well, they didn't. Before I go any further, I want to let you all know that you can check out this game for yourself right now. There's already a free demo available. Actually, that's all that's available. When I was notified that I had been offered a press key of the game for review, I was excited, only to discover that it was just the free demo. A free demo which doesn't save anything and resets itself after a while, so every time you launch it, you have to go through their very long tutorial, and there's basically no time left for looking at any other part of the game. I'm not sure if maybe my demo will be changed into a full version of the game once it launches. If it does, I'll certainly give the full game another try and see if things improve, and I'll make another video or do a stream for you all to check it out with me. But for now, I can only comment on what I experienced in that demo. That includes the tutorial and the first few levels. Sadly, I was prevented from trying the new survival mode or any of the other new game modes. Just bear that in mind. On the other hand, honestly, I think I've seen enough to form an opinion. To explain what I dislike about One Finger Death Punch 2, I need to show you some of the design from 1. First of all, it's just very clean. There's some interesting stuff going on in the background, but nothing distracting. Anything you need to pay attention to has high contrast and is easy to see. Things you don't need to worry about stay out of your way. While you're playing, your eyes are focused very closely on the center of the screen, right here. This bar beneath your character tells you when you can hit an enemy. If it's gray, you need to wait. If an enemy is within range, it lights up very clearly on that side. If you can't do anything, such as during certain special sequences, the bar disappears entirely. If you pick up a weapon, the entire bar visibly extends, so there's no confusion about your attack range. In your peripheral vision, you can see the enemies approaching. Most of them are gray, which means they will go down in one hit. Colored enemies take more than one hit, or are brawlers, which open up a quick minigame to defeat them. The hits that each multi-hit enemy will require to take them down are indicated by color bars below their hit indicator, which contains a large number, telling you how many hits there are altogether. So the main box with the number in it is most important, as that's the part that changes color and tells you when to attack, but you can use the bars below that to plan the order in which you'll take the enemies down. This is especially important for the ones that change side, and during really fast portions of the game. Weapons are gray or white if they're usable meaning you can catch them, throw them, pick them up, or otherwise use them. If a gray weapon is coming towards you and you need to dodge or deflect it, it only takes one hit. It also has a hitbox with the number one in it, so when you're focused on the hitbar, that's all you need to see. It's functionally no different from a gray enemy. The way the game mechanics work, it doesn't matter whether it's an enemy or a weapon coming towards you. All that matters is how many hits it takes and which direction those hits need to be in. If the weapon is white, it still only takes one hit to catch it, and then your next move will be using that weapon. This rarely affects the decisions the player makes in any significant way. 
you just might have an extended attack range for a bit, or the weapon might take down several enemies for you if you throw it. You don't have any choice about how these things work. It's all about reacting, not strategy. Below the attack bar is the next most important piece of information, your health. You get a large red bar which depletes as you get hit in a way which is easy to see in your peripheral vision, without looking down. This is critical since at high speeds, glancing away from the attack bar can mean death. There's also a large heart with the number of lives you have left clearly displayed, which you can glance at now and then if need be. Above your character is a large display showing how many enemies you've killed so far. Again, it's very close to your center of focus and a high contrast, so if you have a moment to glance up, you can read the number without having to take your attention fully away from the action. In survival mode, there's also a green bar under the health bar, which gradually fills up. When it turns completely green, you enter a bonus round where all enemies become one-hit kills. The speed is much faster than in the rest of the game, and if you've been hurt, there are white enemies which will heal you when you kill them. Again, everything is very high contrast, especially the healing medic enemies. This bonus round is also clearly contrasted with the rest of the game, so you know what mode you're in, and you know when it finishes. The rest of the screen has less important information. In the bottom left and right corners, there are details that the player is unlikely to ever look at. This includes a log of your streaks and combos, an indicator of which special moves are charged up, and your score. It might sound odd that the special moves are tucked away in a corner, but it makes more sense when you realize that you have no control over the special moves. These things happen automatically as you play. They can make things easier, like slowing the enemies down a bit, letting you absorb a hit from a particular type of enemy, or simply giving you an extra life, but you don't decide when they happen, so you don't need to know when they're ready. The background has some fun sets and graphics. These are mainly for a bit of atmosphere, and I guess so that someone watching you play has something extra to look at. They don't interfere with your focus at all, and are basically just decoration. So that's it for One Finger Death Punch. When it comes down to it, the design seems pretty much perfect. Everything comes together to create an intuitive focus system that lets you really get into the zone. How could they possibly improve on this for the sequel? Well, let's just take a look at it and see what changes they made. First of all, that all-important attack bar. Whereas in the first game it was large and centered on the screen, in two it's smaller and lowered down. It still lights up when an enemy is in range, which is good, but it doesn't stand out as much from the background. In fact, it's semi-transparent. The left and right edges are marked with a bright neon strip of color, which, because it's so high contrast, can draw your eye to it and be distracting. When your attack range expands because you've picked up a weapon, the bar itself doesn't actually extend. These neon strips just move out a bit. Overall, it makes it much harder to tell when you should hit and when you should wait. Then there's the enemies in your peripheral vision. The large, clear numbers that changed from gray to color when they entered your attack range are totally gone. Now there are only blocks of color for each hit the enemies will take. The thing is, these blocks are already lit up when they enter the screen and only change slightly when they enter the attack range, so you have less indication of when it's time to attack. There's also a tiny gray strip at the top of each one that turns green when it's in range, but I'm not sure what the point of this is. I didn't even notice it until I was reviewing the video footage. It's certainly not large, bright, or high contrast enough to offer any useful in-game advantage. One-hit enemies are still gray, and multi-hit enemies are still colored, but brawlers are no longer easy to see. They have a different attack icon and are wearing a bandana, but otherwise their image is gray, like the one-hit enemies. This makes it much harder to notice when a brawler is coming, and I was caught off guard many times, something that never happened in the first game. There's a new type of enemy in the game now, which is also very distracting. These special enemies make some change to the game when you kill them. Some are medics, like the white enemies in the first game, and give you a life when you kill them. Others are speed enemies, which increase the level speed after you kill them. This is all fine, but what's not fine is the fact that these enemies are not only colored in, despite taking only one hit to kill, they also have floating icons above their heads. They're made to look like the most important enemies in the game, drawing your attention more than anything else. But why? As I've already mentioned, this game isn't about strategy. You can't decide when you're gonna take down that enemy. When it gets close enough, you punch it, or you get hit. That's it. These special enemies distract from the more important things you need to be focusing on, and I got hit many times as a result of this distraction. 
I also found it odd that while so many aspects of the game are explained in detail in the tutorial, even ones that don't affect your gameplay decisions, like the incoming weapons which I'll get to in a moment, never once does it point out these distraction bombs, or explain why they're there or what they do. So how about weapons? Well, weapons no longer have a consistent color either. For the most part, weapons you can use seem to be colored randomly. It can be brown, white, green, blue. It can get very distracting and confusing. Even worse is the weapons that are thrown at you. There are no fewer than four different tutorial levels about incoming weapons. These weapons are colored differently depending on whether you can block, dodge, catch, or deflect a weapon thrown at you. Why? I have no idea, since it makes no difference whatsoever to the player. A knife or whatever comes in, enters your range, your attack bar lights up, and you press the button. What happens next to the weapon really makes no difference to when or how you react to it. You have no choice. These tutorial levels make it seem like you're meant to strategize your response to weapons, but you can't do that. Worst of all, the enemy throwing the weapon is fully colored in. It's not gray like before. This is incredibly distracting. Colored enemies catch your eye because they take more effort to defeat and require special attention but the enemy throwing the weapon doesn't even enter your range, ever. They throw their weapon, and then run away. There's no reason for them to be colored in. They even distract from the weapon they're throwing, because their body catches your eye more than the tiny moving knife in the air. I have no idea why the developers made this decision. It detracts from the gameplay, and adds nothing. Also, there are guns now? Guns? In a kung fu game? You can even choose skills that improve your use of guns. I... Why? Why are there guns in my kung fu game? I do not want guns, please. I, I don't even... I don't even know what else to say about this. The same goes for chainsaws. Ugh. Let's move on to the rest of the interface. The next most important item is your health. Remember, in the first game, this is displayed with a large, easily visible, high contrast bar right under your attack bar. Where is it now? Uh... Um... Oh. There it is. Up at the top of the screen. Literally as far from your attack bar as it could possibly be. Honestly, it might as well not even be there. You can't see it in your peripheral vision, so there's no way to keep track of your health without glancing away from the action and risking getting hit. When you do take a hit, it shows a heart in the middle of your attack bar with the remaining lives displayed as a numeral. This is just distracting. Your number of kills is just below that tiny health bar. It's in a much smaller text than in the first game, and located too far from your character to be visible. Only useful to people watching you play, I guess. The rest of the info is also extremely tiny. In the top left, you can see your current speed, which is fairly useless information to the player. I mean, you know how fast the game is going. But the player can't see that anyway. I suppose it may be intended as information for onlookers, which is fine. This one doesn't cause any distraction, since the player's eyes are focused firmly on the bottom middle of the screen where the attack bar is. The top right has another bar showing the number of misses you've had. Again, this is never explained. Maybe if you miss too many times you lose the level? I'm really not sure. As for the rest of the screen, it's all just taken up with... spectacle, I guess? Rather than having a simple background that the player can ignore, there's a lot of flashing, flickering, screen shake, explosions, and other distractions going on which I found really irritating. The overall effect of the game screen is just one of distraction. It's like the entire game is based on the no Luca no mode of the first game, where the developer's cat will jump in the way and obscure part of the battle until you shoo it away. Fun is a silly challenge, but annoying is part of the base game. Oh my god, stop. Let's take a look at a few other specific changes between the first and second games. I've mentioned the brawlers already. In the first game, you always knew when they were coming, but in two, they tend to blend in and sneak up on you. Actually, fighting them has also changed considerably. In the first game, you have this clean interface. The hits you need to make are grouped clearly, allowing you to rapidly enter the moves you need to make without having to waste much effort in deciphering which moves those are. You can focus your energy on the reflex, rather than interpreting the prompts. In two, the indicators are much harder to decipher. Yes, you can do it, but it takes a lot more effort. There isn't the same contrast between hits that there was in one, and I found it harder to judge how many hits I needed to make in each direction. The hits are also spaced out more randomly. It just doesn't have the same flow as the first game. 
The changes to the Ball of Death really confused me. In the first game, sometimes an enemy would carry a Ball of Death, which you could kick repeatedly and take down many enemies with. There was no confusion about when it was coming or where it was on the screen. It didn't have a number below it, but your attack bar lit up when it was in range, and because it stood out so clearly against the rest of the screen, it was easy to keep track of. It also had a distinct sound effect whenever it hit the ground, so you're always aware of its presence, as well as the moment when it left the screen. In 2, the Ball of Death just sort of appears. It comes in quickly, seemingly at random. It's lit up with all kinds of effects, but that doesn't necessarily call your eye to it, since the entire screen is full of these flashy effects. It also has a bar under it, like other enemies, but the bar is green, low contrast against the background, and it doesn't change when it enters your attack range. It also doesn't always light up your attack bar when it's in range, so it's very difficult to keep track of. Instead of a cool weapon for taking down lots of enemies in a row, it just becomes a distraction, like so many others. Both games have bonus rounds, but 2 gets far more into these than the first one did. By bonus round, I'm referring to a period within a level, which changes the mechanics of that level temporarily. In the first game, the only example of this is the special rounds during survival mode that happen when that green bar fills up. When this happens, the entire screen changes. Your character and all enemies change to black, except for the medics, which are white and super easy to spot as soon as they enter the screen. And the background changes to a more or less solid color that contrasts well. You're given a weapon, generally a laser sword or an nunchaku, which kills all enemies in one hit. Below your health bar are now four blue circles which deplete when you get hit, in a way which is highly visible even in your peripheral vision. Once you lose that last circle, you return to the main game mode. This means the screen, again, visibly changes, completely, and the game also slows down for a second to give you a chance to prepare for what's coming. Overall, this mode is very clear. You can see when it's coming, and you know when it ends, and the difference from the main mode is quite obvious. In 2, there are several of these bonus rounds. My only experience with them was in the tutorial level which shows off several types. There is much less warning of when a bonus round is beginning. Suddenly, the words get ready appear on the screen, and a shield appears around your character. Other than that, the screen doesn't change. Then you either start moving steadily in one direction, running or on a horse, or you get a shuriken weapon which you need to throw at all the incoming enemies whose hit bars are gone. There was so little warning about this beginning that it took me a moment to realize what I was supposed to do. What's more, in the shuriken mode, your attack bar is still there, but no longer lights up, so it's unclear at first that you can now hit any enemy on either side of the screen. When one of these bonus rounds ends, the text, blank, round over, appears on the screen, and then normal play resumes immediately. I found this incredibly confusing. I thought the level itself was over at first, and was ready to put the controller down, only to realize there are more enemies coming in at a full speed. The overall effect reflects an ongoing theme with this sequel. It's all jarring, distracting, and confusing. It interrupts the flow of play. In the end, I found I was totally unable to get into the zone while playing the sequel. It may be that I'd get used to the changes and find it easier with time, but honestly, I don't really want to. The spirit of One Finger Death Punch, for me, has always been its simplicity, focus, and flow, and all of those aspects are missing in the sequel. I've been scratching my head trying to figure out why Silver Dollar Games made the decisions they did when designing it, and in the end, I'm really not sure. Maybe their focus was simply on making it flashier and more visually interesting, not necessarily to the player who will be distracted by such things, but for the people watching them play? I can't really say. It's possible that if you haven't played the first game, you might really enjoy the flashy action of the sequel, but as someone who knows and loves the original and still goes back to play it now and then when I need a little stress relief, I don't think I will ever be won over by this new version. In the end, you don't have to take my word for it. You can try their demo on Steam for free. And if you decide to go with the first game, it's only a few dollars, euros, or pounds, and I'd say it's well worth that price. And if neither of these games is your cup of tea, don't worry. I'll be back soon with another new indie game. Who knows? That one might just turn out to be your new favorite game. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.